Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another installment of Evenings at the Conservancy. We're so glad you've chosen to join us here tonight. Uh, we're very grateful to our series sponsors who are making all these wonderful presentations possible, and that is V at Bentley Village, also our good friends at Collins Vision. So thanks to both of them for being such loyal supporters of Evenings at the Conservancy. Tonight's presentation is all about investing in the Everglades and what that means for our ecosystem and for all of you. And we're so excited that you're going to be able to hear tonight from someone who really is an expert in the field, our Water Policy and Everglades Manager, Marissa Carozo. Marissa really is an incredibly dedicated conservationist. She also wears a couple of hats in addition to her role here at the Conservancy. For the past three years, she has been the uh, co-chair of the Everglades Coalition, a coalition of over 60 organizations speaking with one voice to restore America's Everglades. We're so proud of Marissa's leadership position, and we're so excited that tonight you'll be able to hear directly from her with all the latest trends, the information about progress towards attaining that dream of truly restoring our Everglades and improving our uh, water quality, particularly here on the West Coast. So I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to the second virtual evenings at the Conservancy. My name is Marissa Carozo and I'm the Everglades and Water Policy Manager at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. And today we will be talking about a never before seen opportunity to significantly advance Everglades restoration projects by investing in water and natural infrastructure projects over the next four years. Now, why is this important? The most recent estimates for the total cost of Everglades restoration is $23 billion, of which about $6.5 billion has been invested thus far. Now, $23 billion is a staggering number by any measure. But the true measure is the cost of not investing to keep the largest ecosystem restoration project in the world on track. We know that Everglades restoration protects the drinking water supply for millions of Floridians. It will help mitigate the impacts of the toxic algae blooms that have plagued our coasts. And it is one of the best defenses against a changing climate by sequestering carbon, preventing saltwater intrusion into our aquifers, and buffering the impacts of hurricanes and storm surge. The healthier the Everglades, the more resilient our communities are. We heard from Dr. Anna pushkin Shevlin in the first evening's presentation about how the cost of hurricanes and storms in Florida have caused damages in excess of $203 billion in Florida. And that number really helps put the $23 billion in perspective, given that Everglades restoration has a four to one return on investment. So in order to accelerate us towards that restoration goal, the opportunity that we're gonna talk about tonight is to invest $2.9 billion in federal funding over the next four years. So why 2.9 billion? That is the question. Well, after decades of laying the groundwork for restoration success, including data collection, planning, and project design, the Army Corps of Engineers, who are the federal partners in charge of restoration, has said that in order to keep all of the current projects on track, that an investment of 725 million per fiscal year, beginning in FY22, is essential. And that equates to uh, the $2.9 billion. And those funds will be put to work building the projects that will improve water quality, water supply, and wildlife habitat. And this opportunity could not come at a more critical time. Investing in the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan will not only improve Florida's environment and water quality, it will also create tens of thousands of quality jobs for Floridians. The Army Corps estimates that 2.9 billion uh, investment in SERP over the next four years will directly result in the creation of 65,000 to 75,000 jobs. And of course, the end result of these efforts will also bolster the tourism and fishing economies that support hundreds of thousands of American families as we seek to recover from the hardship of COVID-19. This graph on the slide shows what happens to the restoration timeline when Everglades restoration gets that big influx of funds over the next four years. We not only save money, we actually finish restoration projects in half the time. The bottom line is we can actually save over $2 billion by investing more now and doing so will deliver ecosystem, human health, and, eco and economic benefits 
faster. So why does investing in Everglades restoration matter for Southwest Florida? In order to answer that question, we need to do the Cliffs Notes version of Everglades 101. Over the past 150 years, South Florida's natural water flow has been severely altered. The Army Corps of Engineers built a massive canal system for flood control and to drain wetlands for development and agriculture. And we now have over a thousand miles of canals in South Florida as a result. And that drainage, even though it facilitated development, also had a lot of unintended con negative consequences for water quality, wildlife habitat, and water supply. So in the year 2000, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, was adopted as the roadmap for restoring the Greater Everglades, which stretches from just south of Orlando all the way south to Florida Bay. And in this, uh, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan includes over 60 projects. Collectively, this is quite literally the largest ecosystem restoration project in the world. And that's not just based on its geographic extent, but also in its complexity and in its expense. It's implemented through a 50-50 state and federal partnership between the South Florida Water Management District and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who you've already heard me reference. You may have heard people use the phrase, get the water right, in reference to Everglades restoration. And that essentially means that we are trying to mimic the function of the natural system before human interference. Because it's impossible to completely put it back together what has been broken as we've irrevocably lost over half of the historic Everglades. So one of the most devastating ways Southwest Florida sees the negative impacts of this altered system are the damaging discharges from Lake Okeechobee to the Caloosahatchee and the associated harmful algae blooms. The other important contextual background to remember is that the Caloosahatchee was never connected to Lake Okeechobee historically. It was only through the channelizing of the system that the C-43 canal was dredged in the late 1800s to connect the west and east coasts of Florida through Lake Okeechobee. Now that connection, in combination with the severing of flows south through agricultural development in the Everglades agricultural area, which you can see on the map here, and the building of the Herbert Hoover Dyke around Lake Okeechobee is the basis for the highly managed system we have today and leads to the high volume damaging discharges we often see during the rainy season. Because when the 730 square mile Lake Okeechobee water levels get too high, the Army Corps releases water to the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie estuaries to protect the integrity of the dike. Because we do not yet have the storage and conveyance south of the lake that will eventually be provided by one of the key Everglades restoration projects, the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. Now, the reason these high volume discharges are so disastrous for our coast and the Caloosahatchee is because healthy estuaries are all about getting the right balance of clean, fresh water. And this is needed to protect the species that rely on this really important estuarine system. So even though organisms in estuaries are tolerant of natural salinity fluctuations as the tide moves, there are optimal ranges under which they thrive. And too long or in, in too low or too high salinity levels or really fast and extreme swings in salinity is very harmful, especially for species like seagrasses, for example, which aren't mobile. They can't escape to a better suited area. So what does this mean for the Caloosahatchee? When there is too much fresh water being delivered to the estuary, whether it's from Lake O discharges, the Caloosahatchee watershed, or as is often the case, a combination of the two, the salinities drop and there's also a big influx of nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient pollution that contribute to harmful algae blooms, like those we saw in 2018. Both Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee watersheds are very polluted by years of agricultural runoff, as well as urban and wastewater inputs. So conversely, we also have to talk about the other side of the equation, which is too little water flow, because that's also a major stressor for the Caloosahatchee during the dry season. And this exemplifies what we like to refer to as a balancing act or a Goldilocks effect, because we need just the right amount of fresh water flow to the Caloosahatchee throughout the year to protect those uh, salinity levels. So to recap, we have this vastly altered landscape that's been drained, ditched, 
It, we have urban development, agriculture, the changing of water flows throughout the system. And we have an enormous amount of nutrient pollution that has led us to the point where we end up with toxic algae blooms, wildlife mortality, serious human health impacts, and of course, cascading e economic repercussions as well. So some of the major events we've seen over the past five years was the record setting rainfall we got in the dry season of 2016. And that was followed closely by Hurricane Irma in 2017 and the subsequent record setting simultaneous red tide blooms and cyanobacteria blooms or blue green algae blooms in 2018. Sanibel and Fort Myers Beach reported combined losses of 87 million between July and December of 2018. And they removed over four tons of dead marine life from beaches in Lee County. There's also very serious human health implications that are still being researched and quantified. So it was both an environmentally and economically devastating event. And that's why given how, how even more valuable our natural resources have become in the middle of a global pandemic, we have to remain laser focused on solutions to address these issues. Because until we build the projects to store, treat, and convey water, like the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, and until we manage Lake O better, and until we get a handle on nutrient pollution inputs, history can continue to repeat itself. So I'm going to share a couple slides from, and pictures back from 2018. And I'm sure many of those viewing this presentation may have experienced these harmful algal blooms firsthand, whether it was in 2018, 2016, or even before then. But for those of you who haven't, or are new additions to the community, I wanted to share a couple before and after photos. So this is an aerial photo along the Clusahatchee taken from Google Earth in early 2018. And this is the same view in August of 2018 during a flight I took with Lighthawk. You can almost not distinguish between the green of the grass and the green of the algae. And you'll notice that the house that's depicted in this photo was actually in the process of being built in the first photo. So I can only imagine the homeowner's surprise when they had a blue-green algae bloom literally in their backyard. And again, this is a typical view of the north side of the Clusahatchee in the estuarine portion of the river. And again, during August of 2018. So these photos are not intended to discourage anyone, but rather as a reminder that the projects that help reduce the discharges to the estuaries, that help clean up the water, need to remain a really high priority, not just for our community, but our federal and state agencies and our elected representatives. And like we discussed earlier, these high volume damaging releases, especially when they go on for prolonged periods of time, can stress or kill aquatic species and contribute to those harmful algal blooms. So the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir is perhaps the most talked about restoration project in recent years. The reservoir will be located, located south of Lake Okeechobee and it's projected to help reduce those damaging discharges to the estuaries by about 55%, which is a really significant improvement. This is also the only Everglades restoration project that provides the dual benefits of both reducing high volume discharges and sending clean water south simultaneously to the Everglades and Florida Bay. So an update on the status of this project is that the stormwater treatment area is already under construction and fully funded. And this is a picture from the groundbreaking. And if we can achieve the 2.9 billion in federal funding, this will help ensure that the EAA reservoir is complete in the six year projected time uh, frame that the Army Corps has put out there and is ready to go to work. Another project that is important for Southwest Florida is the C-43 Reservoir, which is located in Hendry County, just south of the Clusahatchee River and State Road 80. And this project will complement the benefits provided by the EAA Reservoir. The project is currently under construction with a target completion date of 2023. So we are just around the corner from seeing the benefits of this project delivered. Now the purpose of this reservoir is to store water from the watershed and Lake Okeechobee during the rainy season and have it available to release during the dry season to help meet that salinity balance we already talked about that the estuary desperately needs. So while the EAA reservoir will be a significant benefit during high flow times in the rainy season, the C43 will also help address the low flow periods. Again, water storage and the availability of water when it's needed 
are critical components of Everglades restoration projects as a means to mimic the natural system as closely as possible. So this reservoir is roughly the size of the city of Naples. And the water quality treatment component is under development and was a longstanding priority for the conservancy given the harmful algal blooms that plagued the river. And it was a major win for um, those of us on the West Coast who were looking for cleaner water and better water deliveries to the Clusahatchee. Another important project is if you drive about 15 miles east of Naples on Tamiami Trail, you will actually pass the first Everglades restoration project to break ground. It's called the Picayune Strand, and it's restoring 55,000 acres of wetlands and habitat right here in our backyard by removing miles of roads, plugging canals, and using pump stations to rehydrate the landscape. The project is scheduled to be complete in 2024, but scientists have already documented the return of wading birds and other signs of a rebounding ecosystem. It shows that restoration works, and we have to remain laser focused on keeping restoration moving forward. And I'm sure at this point in my presentation, you know the word I'm about to say. The key word is funding. These projects take years to design and implement, even under ideal circumstances. And without consistent funding on a year-to-year -year basis, it's extremely difficult to keep projects on track and execute contracts when you don't know if the funding will be available the next year. So where do we go from here? Here are the Everglades priorities for the next year. We need to speak in one united voice to support federal government investment in Everglades restoration of 2.9 billion over the next four years. We need to continue strong state funding. We need to keep restoration projects on track and prioritize those that reduce damaging discharges and send clean water south. And of course, we also need to advocate for managing Lake Okeechobee for the health of the lake, the estuaries, and the Everglades. Everglades restoration is a significant priority for us in Southwest Florida because it will have those far reaching benefits for water quality, our economy, and for protecting public health. It will help us build resiliency as natural infrastructure to combat the impacts of sea level rise. It replenishes the aquifers we rely on for drinking water supplies. And it supports the foundation of our tourism-based economy. Clean water, clean estuaries, and a quality of life to help our human and wildlife communities thrive. So thank you for joining me on this Everglades journey tonight. And that concludes my presentation.